All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Katrina Croft Cusworth. I'm the Communications and Events Coordinator at the Melbourne Energy Institute. Um, thank you all for joining us today for the third installment of our MEI Network um, seminar series. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that today we are gathered on the lands of the Wurundjeri, Woiwurrung and Bunwurrung people who have been custodians of this land for thousands of years, and we acknowledge and pay our respects to their elders past and present. There will be time for Q&A at the end of the session, and we'll try to get through as many of your questions as we can. For those online, please enter your questions into the Q&A box. Now over to our director, Professor Michael Breer, who will moderate today's discussion. Uh, thanks, Katrina, and uh, hello, everybody, and welcome in person or online to uh, another of our MEI Network seminar series. Uh, today, we're very lucky to have a hybrid event with a real person in a real room in front of a real audience, although those of you online are still our best friends too. Um, uh, but it is nice to see people face to face. Um, this seminar series uh, runs each year, and each year we we rotate through the different energy commodities. Last year, we did the electricity system. This year, we're doing the gas system. And next year, we're going to do discrete commodities like uranium, um, um, coal, uh, other things. So uh, this is the gas year. And we're very lucky to have uh, uh, Carolyn Au from uh, Shell, operations manager up in Queensland. Uh, uh, you probably know where, on, on, uh, up in Gladstone. Uh, and uh, Carolyn specialises in LNG technology and gas processing. Uh, Carolyn has a great deal of experience in this very field. So today's topic, you are hearing from someone who does this stuff probably 24 seven. You probably get phone calls at two in the morning every now and again as an operations manager, I'm guessing. Uh, but Carolyn has 22 years of industrial experience in this sector. She first joined Shell in the Netherlands, working as an LNG and gas technology design engineer before moving into operations and asset management. I had therefore assumed that Carolyn grew up in the Netherlands, but she grew up in Perth and worked in Melbourne for Shell as well. Is that right? Or Perth at least. Uh, there you go. So 22 years ago, started at Shell, but an Aussie. Uh, and then also subsequently spent time uh, working on a two-train LNG facility in on Sakhalin Island in Russia. Nice and cold there in winter. And then, of course, three years uh, at Curtis Island in Gladstone, Queensland. Carolyn's now based in Brisbane, in a lovely big building overlooking the Brisbane River that I've been to. And we're very fortunate to have her speak to us today. So look, thanks for coming from Brisbane to give this talk in person, Carolyn. That's very kind of you. It's, we were often talking about how much we enjoy being together and forgetting, we'd forgotten how much we enjoyed working together and being together and learning together. So we appreciate you coming from the beautiful city of Brisbane to join us today. Please welcome uh, Carolyn. Okay, I've turned myself on. I hope everybody can hear me. Okay. So before I um, start, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands upon which Shell QGC operates on the East Coast. So in Brisbane, it's the Jagger and the Turbul people. In the Surat Basin, where our gas is sourced, it's the Big Amble, the Iman and the Jarawea people. And on Curtis Island, uh, in the Gladstone region, it's the Baili, the Gurang Gurang, the Gurang and the Terabila and Banda. So I've spent three years, um, the last three years of my life, I'm working on Curtis Island. It is a, um, a rich source of um, uh, hunting for the traditional owners. Um, there's a lot of fish, turtles, dugong um, uh, located there. And it's also in the north of the island an ancestral burial ground. So taking the ferry across to the island every morning, I recognize the, the beauty and the connection that the traditional owners have with that, with the lands and the waters. As, um, let me change slides. So um, as Michael's introduced, I've been working in the hydrocarbon industry for over 20 years, 15 of that um, in LNG. Um, I'm immensely proud of what LNG has brought to the world. It's brought a lot of energy and with energy comes security. So the lifestyles of people and the, 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 sorry, the quality of life um, is, sorry, 
energy is um, quite fundamental to quality of life. And there are a number of people and countries in the world who now have healthcare, safety, security, um, because of safe energy supply, which is brought by LNG. Um, additionally, um, what I'd like to share today is how the mix of energy is going to change in the next 20 to 30 years. Um, we talk a lot about the Paris Agreement these days and the intention of the world to limit climate change to no more than one and a half degrees. And I'd like to share that LNG and gas is going to be quite critical to achieving that. So my presentation today um, will focus on a few areas, a few of um, some fundamental information about LNG, some basics around the LNG supply chain, um, a, a little bit about the, the demand projection we have for gas and LNG in the world, and finally where LNG stands in terms of a, a net zero transition. So first of all, what is natural gas? Well, natural gas basically is a, a mixture of light hydrocarbon components, um, mostly methane, anywhere from 70 to 98 uh, mole percent. It has some ethane, some propane and some butane and also the impurities, which we um, uh, consider to be water, CO2, hydrogen sulfide and some nitrogen. Um, the composition of LNG uh, depends on the reservoirs from which it's extracted. They differ all over the world. What you see on the top right hand side, um, the chart shows the high heating value and the Wobby index of a number of different fields and um, LNG sites um, where they produce from. So LNG um, differs a little bit from oil in that it is sold on the basis of energy content. So high, heavy heating value BTUs per million scuffs. Uh, oil, as you all know, is sold more along the lines of a, a barrel of oil with a certain density range. So when we cool LNG down to minus 162 degrees, we get a clear, colourless, non-toxic and non-flammable liquid um, at atmospheric pressure. It makes it very safe to transport. And it also increases its um, uh, energy density by reducing the volume to 1 600. One six hundred. So that makes it a, um, a, a much more easily transported, effectively transported product. Which then brings us to the why of LNG. Well, fundamentally, LNG is just the form of gas, but it is, it's an efficient way of getting gas to users. So the people of the world, the cities, the industries, the countries, and particularly those who don't have their own natural supply of gas. So gas fields do tend to be in fairly inconvenient locations. They tend to be offshore, in deep water, really not easy to get to. Um, if distance is short and the volumes are reasonable for transport of gas, then pipelines are, uh, are very common. They work. They're a good technology. They're quite simple. But when the distances are very long and the volumes are high, over about 3,000 kilometres, the cost and complexity of pipeline supply um, becomes quite significant and LNG becomes the solution of choice. So the dampier to... Um, the Bunbury to Dampier pipeline um, in Western Australia is 1,500 kilometres long. There are a number of very long pipelines in China, across Europe, in Russia. Um, however, pipelines, when they're built, are quite fixed. They're a little bit inflexible. It's hard to get them to different places. And also, it becomes very expensive to build very large pipelines. So basically, LNG enables the international trade of energy. It, uh, it provides energy security for countries without their own energy supply, and it also allows flexibility of supply. So as a country, you can choose to buy Australian LNG or Nigerian LNG. I was going to say Russian LNG, but not, not these days. Um, Omani LNG, Middle Eastern LNG. And these suppliers also can choose to sell to um, other countries throughout the world. So it's that flexibility, that transportability that makes it such a valuable fuel. fuel. Now to the how of LNG. Well, making LNG, cooling things down to a liquid is a technology that's quite well known now. Everyone here will have a, a version of it in their own kit. Sorry, I'm trying to, I might stand here with the, the, the light here. Um, your refrigerator um, is basically a, um, a, a very small version of um, LNG technology. You have a compressor and you have refrigerant, you have the Joule Thompson effect that cools things down. So an LNG plant basically uses the same technology, just on a much larger and a more efficient scale. 
So there are a few steps in making LNG. First of all, you must take the gas and clean it. So you must remove the, um, the components which are considered impurities. So CO2, hydrogen sulfide, uh, nitrogen, water also is considered a um, impurity. These things will freeze up and um, block the process in the production. Also, they are um, they're undesirable components which um, end users do not like. So cleaning the gas um, is the first step. Uh, drying the gas is the second step. And then finally cooling the gas to LNG. So the cooling process um, basically consists of um, refrigerant, which is circulated in a compression system, and then a pressure letdown, which results in a colder gas that draws heat from the, from the natural gas. There's a couple of different technologies um, in how to make LNG, but the thermodynamic fundamentals remain the same. The differences are in the, um, the, the equipment which is used. So for example, the main coil wound heat exchanger versus a um, aluminium brazed heat exchanger. Uh, there's two main processes which um, uh, underpin the baseload LNG production in the world. The mixed refrigerant process, which uses a, uh, a mixture of um, natural gas components, methane, ethane, propane, butane, and some nitrogen. And the, the second common process is the cascade process, which uses pure components. So an LNG plant really is special in a, a, a few um, of the different elements. It has very large compressors uh, driven by very large turbines. It has um, a lot of heat exchanger area. Um, it has a, a way to reject heat to the atmosphere, either by air coolers or seawater. Um, and then it has the LNG storage tanks, which um, store the LNG before it's shipped out. So I just want to go through a, a little bit about the, um, the, the history of LNG now. And I found this quite interesting um, as I researched it, because I'm used to making it, but um, I did learn a lot from this. So it was in the um, early 1800s that the great names, the, science, the scientific names of Faraday, Joule and Kelvin, they experimented with liquefying pure components. It was probably um, Olszewski in 1886, who you could call the, um, the father of um, LNG because he liquefied methane, which is the, the main component of um, LNG. The first actual facility for, for liquefying gas was built in the United States. That was actually built to extract helium, a very small component of natural gas for um, military um, purposes. And um, the, the facility actually revaporized the LNG um, to be used as natural gas afterwards. Um, the first commercial LNG plant was built in Ohio in 1941. Unfortunately, in 1944, um, an accident occurred, which is still considered the worst um, incident um, in LNG history. So one of the um, LNG storage tanks um, started to leak. LNG came out. It vaporized into natural gas and then it moved into the, um, the, the areas where there was housing, people living, went into sewers. It ignited flattened quite a lot, large part of um, Cleveland and killed 140 people. So coming out of that incident, um, a lot of lessons were learned about how to store LNG above ground versus below ground and also the siting of um, a major accident hazard facilities, which should not be close to um, areas where there is high, high pop population density. The first shipment of LNG across the oceans occurred in 1959. 2,000 tonnes was um, shipped from the USA to UK via a vessel called the Methane Pioneer. So that was 2,000 tonnes in 1959. These days, LNG vessels ship at around 120, 130,000 tonnes. So starting small, getting big. Um, shortly after that, the first LNG supply contract was established from Algeria to the UK. About 80,000 tonnes per year were shipped via two purpose-built LNG carriers. Some 10 years, 10 years later, there were three countries in the manufacture of um, LNG, Algeria, Libya, and Brunei. Australia's first foray into LNG occurred in 1989. In Western Australia, the Northwest Shelf uh, shipped its first shipment of um, LNG to Japan. And by that time also, there were eight countries manufacturing LNG. In the 1990s, LNG became a, a, a real powerhouse um, of energy supply. So the, the countries that, that you will, you know, that you will have heard about in the LNG game, Nigeria, Qatar, Malaysia, Brunei, Oman, and also Australia. A lot of, um, a lot of prosperity brought to those countries and a lot of energy brought to the world in that time period. 
Um, our second LNG facility was uh, built in Darwin in 2006 from the Bayou Wundan gas fields offshore. Shortly after, um, in 2009, Russia started in LNG with a Sakhalin facility. Um, as Michael mentioned, I was there for seven years, best job I ever had. Um, in 2014, um, QCLNG Curtis Island in Queensland started up uh, with coal seam methane um, as a supply of gas. Uh, I was there for three years from 2018 to 2020, end of 2021, 22. Second best job I ever had. Um, LNG is coming thick and fast in Australia. So I'm sure you've all heard of the Gorgon project in Western Australia, mega gas fields um, offshore. Gorgon started up in 2016. But also at that point, the United States started to um, import, export their first commercial LNG from shale gas. So they started with LNG, but then they had a bit of a hiatus. Um, a lot of shale gas was discovered in the United States and they are becoming a very, very big exporter of LNG. 2018-19, the first floating LNG was um, uh, commissioned in Australian waters, the Prelude FLNG off the coast of Western Australia. And interestingly, we start to get into the, um, the carbon neutral discussion. So the first carbon neutral LNG cargo was delivered in 2019. So to today, to the end of 21, um, some 60 years later on from the, the first LNG supply contract, 380 million tonnes of LNG have been shipped worldwide, over 600 vessels, um, 600 vessels um, uh, doing that um, shipment. The world's largest importer of LNG is China at 79 million tonnes. Uh, LNG is our third largest commodity by value. It's 30 billion US dollars worth of um, export product. We export around 81 million tonnes last year. The United States, however, is projected to be the biggest world exporter of LNG this year. And LNG accounts for about a quarter of the world's energy supply. So moving on to um, the supply chain of LNG. So what, is, what, what do we mean when we talk about the supply chain of LNG? Basically, um, the, the value chain is just a phrase that describes the journey of a molecule. It starts in the reservoir where it was created by geological time and pressure. It comes up through the wellhead. It goes to a gas processing and liquefaction plant where it is processed and turned into LNG. Then it goes onto a ship where it sails off to its export destination um, uh, at the importing country. It is um, taken off the ship, stored in LNG storage, and then before it goes out to end users, it has to be regasified. So that means basically the, the LNG liquid needs to be turned back into vapor to be sent to its end users in a domestic gas network to supply heating and cooling, to power plants, to industry. So commercially, LNG is quite different from the traditional oil market. So typically uh, LNG buyers and sellers come together and they develop um, long-term agreements. Often these agreements are signed well before any earth is turned in terms of um, uh, building an LNG plant. So it's very expensive and takes a long time to build LNG plants. They're in the vicinity of, um, takes about four years and at, at least and multiple um, billions of dollars. So both the buyer and the seller need that um, uh, security of, um, supply and a security of having a, um, a, a source of gas, uh, particularly for buyers, because if they don't get their LNG, then the lights go off in whatever country they're in. So often they will take a small stake in ownership of the LNG plants, which they buy from. Um, so these long-term um, sales and purchase agreements um, are on the five to 10 year um, time horizon. Um, uh, the supply of LNG um, by shipping, um, the shipping may be uh, under, the, under the, the, the remit of the buyer or the seller. Um, LNG vessels are, are very expensive to, to operate and to run. Uh, they're most often they're, um, they're chartered, but their charter rates are anywhere in the 50 to $100,000 per day. So uh, efficiency in, um, in the, the management of a, a shipping fleet is very important. So the supply and um, the sales and purchase agreements um, generally will have um, uh, specific information on things such as the contractual specification. 
So what is the heating value? What is the limits of the components um, and impurities in the LNG? Um, it will talk about delivery points. So FOB um, or DES, this refers to where the ownership of the LNG changes hands. So FOB is free on board. So basically when, an L when LNG comes from the, the LNG producing facility and goes onto the shipping vessel, that is FOB and that's where the, the um, ownership changes hands. DES is delivery ex ship. So when the ship has sailed to the terminal and LNG comes off the ship to the terminal, then that is where the DES um, ownership changes hands. Uh, it will talk about shipping and port locations, um, com compatibility of um, uh, vessels coming into these particular ports. Uh, it'll talk about loading requirements. So how do you load LNG um, on the, the vessel? How do you measure how much um, has been loaded? What procedures are required? How do you calculate it? Um, uh, in having produced LNG for 15 years, it's, it's very interesting. Um, I find there are a number of um, units which are used. So we always say that we will receive the gas um, as millions of scuffs. We will pr process it. Um, in tons per day, we will load it in cubic meters and then we'll get paid for it in um, MMBTU. So you need to, to be able to convert quite, um, quite effectively. Of course, it talks about price and invoicing and of course it has a, a discussion on the, um, the dispute process. So I mentioned that um, uh, when you get LNG to your buyer, um, it needs to be turned back into natural gas before you send it out to the domestic gas grid. So vaporizing LNG, turning it back into gas um, is not as difficult as um, turning it into LNG, but it still requires um, quite a bit of um, uh, equipment. It requires a lot of storage. The most common technology used is the open rack vaporizer. And that basically uses seawater to, um, as the, the heat source to vaporize LNG. Uh, open rack vaporizer is very popular because LNG terminals tend to be uh, on the coast for access to shipping. There are also submerged combustion vaporizers, um, ambient air vaporizers, which can be used in areas where you are not close to the coast. And also if you want to, um, to boost the, um, the gas supply. So submerged combustion and shell and tube vaporizers actually burn a little bit of LNG to create that heat. So they're, um, they're not, um, they're not as um, attractive in terms of the, um, the economy for um, regasification. Re Storage of LNG is a very important, um, uh, uh, an important topic because um, LNG is one of those things which um, is a bit of a use it or lose it fuel. So LNG constantly um, boils off at the rate of 0.07% per day. So uh, buyers and sellers uh, must manage their LNG stocks very carefully. Um, speedy shipping is very important. Um, if you look at um, oil and coal, for example, it's, it's feasible and I think it has been done where people have bought cargoes of oil and coal and they've sailed them around the world for a bit, waiting for a, a better price. Um, can't do that with LNG. You will lose it by the time you um, finish your um, journey. Uh, one way of... Um, uh, adding to um, capacity is uh, through the use of floating storage and regasification units. So this is basically repurposing existing LNG carriers, uh, putting a, um, a gasification unit on them and using them uh, basically as um, a quick uptime um, and reasonably cheap uh, way of adding LNG storage and adding LNG capacity. So the first FSRUs were um, were built and commissioned in um, 2009, 2010. The Golar Spirit and the Golar Freeze. I visited the Golar Freeze in um, Dubai. It was um, used there as a, a peak shaving um, source of um, gas for the, um, the, the hot Middle Eastern summers. Um, yes, that's right. So, so transport. Now, LNG has traditionally been used as a base load fuel for fixed assets, things like power generation, um, the manufacturing industry, uh, heating and cooling of homes. However, um, in the last few years, a new sector has arisen and that's around transport. So shipping and also heavy road haulage. I read a statistic the other day that um, over 80% of the 
the products that are manufactured and traded through the world actually go via ship. So it's quite a um, a, a massive um, uh, industry in terms of transport. Traditionally, ships have been run on diesel, heavy fuel oil, marine bunker fuel. LNG as a fuel has 20 to 25% less emissions than diesel and heavy fuel oil. So as the world moves to that net zero, lower emissions, lower carbon um, uh, uh, future, then the conversion of um, shipping from those heavy fuels to LNG is something which is becoming more and more popular. And actually around 30% of the new ship orders now are for LNG fueled ships. Ooh. So that was um, uh, a bit of a, a background on LNG. I believe that we have a, a stop now for Q&A before I move on. Well, thanks, Carolyn. Uh, any questions from the floor? We've got some online. I've got some myself. I've always wanted to know, when you chill natural gas and turn it into minus 162 degrees, um, thanks, Katrina, um, how much purer do you end up with the stuff that comes out of your LNG train and goes onto the ship than the stuff that goes in? Okay, very good question. So, oh. okay, I'm on now. Yep. Okay. Um, so yes. Yeah, so before, um, so when natural gas comes into an LNG plant, uh, you need to 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 do that step that I said, cleaning. Yeah. Um, so we often have we will have an acid gas removal unit that mm. will remove the um, the CO two and the H two S down to fifty ppm levels. That's the that's the upper limit um, before it will freeze out within the um, process. So if I cast my mind back to um, Sakhalin, where I was working, uh, that gas was actually quite clean gas. It was less than 1% CO2. So you can imagine 1% CO2 down to 50 ppm, um, a reduction, but not um, a lot. Gorgon gas um, is very high in um, CO2. Um, and I, I'm thinking it's somewhere along the lines of 10 or 11%. So if you, if you think of removing 10 to 11%, of that gas from, from of the CO2 from that gas, and that will be a, a reduction of obviously 10 to 11%. There's another, um, another part of the components is ethane, propane, and butane. So propane and butane is, is LPG. So it's just the, the stuff that comes in your um, barbecue bottles. Um, we like to remove that um, because that will also freeze up in the process, but it actually has quite a lot of value being sold as a separate product. And also, for a mixed refrigerant process, we use that as the um, the refrigerant um, feed for the, the liquefaction cycle. So that's the beauty of a, a mixed refrigerant process is actually self-supporting. That was my suspicion is that you actually end up taking all that stuff out. Yes, before it, yes. So it's basically, it's almost pure methane that you put on the ship. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, now we've got plenty of questions online from the 88 people online. Do you have any questions from the room? We have one. Please state your affiliation. No, no I'm joking. That's 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 Robin Batterham, and he's a chemical engineer. <laughs> oh, Chuck, you've just taken my question. And, uh, thanks for that uh, great run through. Um, a couple of quick quick questions. Firstly, um, how much of the trade is outside of long term contracts, and is that changing? And do you see that changing? So how much of the trade is outside? Uh, and then secondly, uh, a more trivial one, uh, in terms of units, um, uh, the units you mentioned are all very logical. Uh, what do the Americans use compared with what Shell uses? Okay, so um, look, on the, 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 the term cargoes and the spot cargo, so I'll go a little bit into um, the, the, the demand in the next section. But generally for an LNG plant, um, you don't want to uh, commit to building it, investing those many billions, um, generally until you have probably 90% under a, a long-term sales and purchase agreement. So we do talk a lot about spot cargoes, um, but I think they're probably rarer than, than, um, than it's made out to be. 
they get a lot of press because you can get three, four, five times um, as much for a spot cargo as you will a term cargo. Mm. And I do recall at my time in Sakhalin sometimes waving goodbye to a, a vessel which was a spot cargo, which was yeah, literally, you know, four times um brought us in four times more money than the previous exactly the same cargo, purely because it was a spot. But if you look at iron ore, mm -hmm. iron ore moved from being all long-term contracts, mm -hmm. iron ore, to virtually being all spots. Yeah, I think... Um, yeah, I guess so. I'm not a I'm not a commercial person, um, and I'm not not a financial person um, either. So I don't want to kind of um, I guess step in too much into that area. But um, in my experience, it's still pretty much a a long term sales and purchase agreement type of um, venture, and that comes a lot with the fact that um, uh, you do have countries like Korea and Japan and China depending on on your product. Um, and having quite specific um, compositional um, requirements going into their grids. Good. That, that, that's a very interesting topic. And obviously, we, we see $35, $40 a gigajoule spot markets for gas at the moment. Mm -hmm. but, well, and I wonder the same thing. Very pertinent to our domestic energy system. We've got a bunch of questions online. Um, some of those I would I would describe as looking at sort of environmental policy and other matters which are very topical at the moment, um, which you may or may not be in a position as an operations manager to answer on behalf of, the, of Shell. Mm -hmm. But also some of these you may discuss in the second half of your talk, mm -hmm. so I don't want to trump that. Um, um, are you, in the second half of your talk, you're going to talk a bit um, more about... Greenhouse the, gas emissions. The global, the global demand, yes, and okay. um, net zero, the where ah, um, LNG okay. sits in the transition to net zero. Probably good. So hopefully, I can answer some of those questions. But if not, then happy to. Um, sure, sure, sure. At the end. Well, let's take let's take those questions, related questions at, in the set at the end of the second half of the talk. But there are questions around um, opportunities for reducing or increasing the productivity of an LNG plant. For example, electrification of drives and other things, and just general ability to improve the operational performance of current LNG trains. So, where, where are those opportunities? Do you see? Um, so, elect so electrification is one which I'll also mention, and that ah. that is around um, actually carbon neutral LNG and reducing the um, the, the emissions footprint. In terms of um, if, uh, improving um, the effectiveness of um, LNG plant. Um, it comes right down to discipline in operation. So uh, indeed, thermodynamically, when you cool down um, natural gas to very cold temperatures, it requires more and more um, uh, energy per unit of LNG made. So we look to extremely efficient or very low temperature differentials in heat exchangers. We look at uh, making sure that um, heat exchangers have minimum fouling. We look at um, high efficiency gas turbines. So um, the early baseload um, LNG plants used uh, what we call the frame machines, frame five, frame seven, frame nine um, industrial gas turbines, which have a efficiency or pulling numbers now around probably 35%. Um, um, so this, these were the kinds of machines that would be used in um, Nigeria, in Sakhalin, in, um, in the Middle East. But um, the, the cascade process, which is what we have on Curtis Island, actually uses the aeroderivative gas turbines. So those gas turbines are far more efficient. Um, they, they are in the 45 plus percent um, efficiency range. And um, if you do benchmarking of um, LNG in terms of energy efficiency, it's absolutely true that the aeroderivative driven plants have a far lower um, uh, greenhouse gas emission um, profile because for every unit of fuel that is burned, you'll get more energy. So creating LNG is just about circulating as much refrigerant as you can. So if you can circulate refrigerant by burning less amount of, um, uh, of fuel, then you're getting a better outcome. Yep. All right, so let's get into the second half of your talk okay. and we'll keep chatting at the end. That's great. Thank you. Excellent. Right, so I want to talk a little bit about the um, the the energy demand, the global energy demand, and the the themes um, which define that. So I've said before that LNG basically provides baseload energy for a lot of countries which are not fortunate enough to have that baseload energy. 
Um, so you have these long-term um, contracts which are agreed to. Now, seasonally, uh, the demand of a, of a country um, varies and this actually goes, goes quite a lot into the way you operate an LNG plant. So in the Northern Hemisphere, it gets very cold and people want LNG for heating. So the winter of the Northern Hemisphere is a very high demand uh, time for LNG. The Middle East recently has had a high demand for, um, for cooling in the summer. So what was traditionally a very kind of cyclical um, demand profile has become a little bit more flattened, but still nevertheless, LNG plants will organize and arrange their maintenance um, downtime for the shoulder seasons and also for, for the, um, the mostly the, the summer season. Um, so talk a little bit about um, uh, demand increase due to high emission industry decarbonisation. So the steel industry, the aluminium industry uh, require a lot of energy to, to create their products. Um, with the, 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 the uh, climate change, the Paris um, Agreement, there's been a, a strong focus from a number of these um, producers to, to move to a lower carbon um, energy supply. So compared to coal, LNG puts out 45 to 55% less emissions. And I've given you that figure of, about um, diesel and heavy fuel oil. Compared to those, LNG produces 20 to 25% less emissions. So there's a lot of pressure around the world now to look to low and no carbon alternatives. And this is where the demand for LNG is becoming quite, um, quite significant. Uh, I'll talk about renewables mix and grid stabilisation a little bit later, but that basically speaks to the um, the, the fact that um, uh, renewables these days rely on, on the sun, they rely on the wind, they rely on water. So the thing about um, gas and LNG is that um, when renewable energy is not available, gas is always available. Um, I wanted to, oh no, it's the next um, section. So... Asian gas demand. So the LNG demand um, from the world predominantly comes from Asia. Two thirds of the demand is actually from China, Korea, Japan, and now India. Um, the overall demand at the moment, um, we say we, it's projected to increase from 380 million tonnes per annum through to about 780 million tonnes per annum by 2040. So that's almost a doubling in the next 25 to 30 years. So the domestic production of gas in Asia is steadily declining. So LNG needs to make up for that shortfall. Population growth is also a driver of this demand. So at the moment, the world's population is around 7.9 billion. It's projected to increase to about 10 billion by 2050. Um, so a lot, a lot more people demanding a lot more um, product, a lot more quality of life. The world's largest co consumer of coal is China, and China consumes about half of global demand. By comparison, um, around coal here in Australia, we consume about one and a half percent of world demand. Now, China has declared that by 2026, it's going to reduce its uh, reliance on coal and reduce the importation of it. But at the same time, their plans in place for new coal-fired stations are over 150 gigawatts from now until 2026. So last year alone, there was 38 gigawatts of new coal-fired power station built in China. Um, as, a, um, as a comparator, the entire uh, national electrical market in Australia is 56 gigawatts. So basically, in the next four years, China is going to build four times the current demand of electricity in coal plants within their country. And that's on top of the already existing 1,008, 1,010 gigawatts of coal. Now, I've said that um, uh, compared to coal, LNG emissions are 45 to 55% less um, in terms of the greenhouse gas. So imagine what kind of world we would be in reducing our emissions if those coal-fired plants switched to gas. So the economic growth of ordinary citizens of, of the world and places like China, which um, particularly have, they haven't come to the same um, uh, quality of life that, that we enjoy in the Western world. I don't believe that they should be um, delayed or stopped because of that, but they do have a, um, 
a really great opportunity to reduce those um, emissions which are coming from their um, coal-fired power sector. So talking about um, global LNG supply, um, at the moment, Australia, we are just the, um, the highest producer of LNG in the world. Uh, we've kind of been neck and neck with Qatar for the last couple of years, um, or around 80 million tonnes. However, as I mentioned before, the United States is also coming um, fast on our heels. Um, the shale gas, which um, they have on shore, has um, really accelerated their um, ability to, to export to the market. And the projection is that by the end of this year, they will actually be, be exporting more LNG than any other country in the world. Russia is um, also there, um, but it remains to be seen how that goes forward based on the, the current situation in the Ukraine. So when I first went to Russia in 2011 on Sakhalin, there were two LNG trains, the two that I worked on. By the time I left in 2018, there were another three which were um, in operation under Gazprom, um, and a few Gazprom affiliates. Uh, now there's an, an additional eight LNG trains which are either in production or construction. So that ramp up has been quite significant in Russia as well. This little map just gives you a bit of a, a, a view of um, where Australian LNG is at. So you see on the, the north and the, um, the west coast is where most of the LNG trains are. Um, and they all come from offshore gas. So um, gas in offshore waters that need to be brought on, onto land for uh, processing and liquefaction. On the East Coast, you have the three plants and they're all on Curtis Island. They're, we're all neighbors. We were in the middle. We had um, APLNG and um, Santos um, next to us. We were kind of the meat and the sandwich. Um, but those three um, LNG plants with two trains each, so six trains in total, are all fed from onshore gas. So onshore coal bed methane gas, which is um, quite different to, to the profile that we have on the West Coast. Oops. Hmm, my technology is not working. Oh, there we go. All right. Okay, so now I want to talk a little bit about um, LNG and the net zero transition. Hopefully, um, I'll be able to answer some of the questions which um, have been asked online. So what is the role of gas in a changing energy system? Well, I've, I've mentioned that a few times that the world's appetite for net zero, that one and a half percent, one and a half degree uh, maximum um, uh, global temperature rise rise um, has accelerated rapidly. Um, we all we all are focused on honouring that Paris Agreement and uh, people are looking um, constantly now for low and no carbon um, uh, options. So in Australia, we are blessed. We have plenty of sunshine for solar and battery. We have plenty of water for hydro. We have plenty of wind for um, wind energy. But as we expand the renewable proportion, we do still need a transition fuel. So the experiences of the East Coast in the last um, few months, um, whereby uh, we had, I would say almost a, a total collapse in the energy system due to an increase in demand and a reduction in supply. So the weather, um, the weather was cloudy and overcast. There was um, very little solar um, power. The um, coal-fired power stations were undergoing maintenance or had been um, significantly impacted by floods either themselves or the, um, the, the coal supply. And there was a lot of coal which was um, uh, also um, going out overseas to, to support other countries. So um, fundamentally, there's a lot of scenarios which look at what the, world, what the world's energy supply is going to be like in the next 20 to 30 years. I would say about 60, 40, um, the predictions uh, from world think tanks and um, also, of course, um, energy companies like ourselves, is that gas will, it will, it will increase or, or um, flatline, but the reduction, an expected reduction is probably um, less um, expected. So fundamentally, um, I think what we've seen over the last, um, I guess, six months with what's happening in the world is that relying on only two or three sources of um, uh, uh, energy supply is pretty risky. So I see that the future for energy is very much one of diversity. 
think we'll have six or seven different um, uh, sources of, of energy and gas will definitely be there in the mix because gas is a firming fuel supply. So the next slide pretty much says it all. Gas is there when the sun doesn't shine, the wind doesn't blow or the rain does not fall. So these charts uh, look at um, electricity mix in different places around the world. So in California, the UK, um, in Brazil. Um, and what it's basically showing us is that, um, for example, in the UK, which relies a lot on uh, wind power, when there is less wind, then we need gas. In Brazil, when, which relies on hydropower, again, when there is um, less hydro, then we need gas. And California, it looks like it's in a pretty good state, actually. They have a very good um, diverse mix of um, energy supply. They have renewables, gas, hydro, they have nuclear. Um, so they, they, are, they are quite stable in terms of um, being able to, to meet their um, demands. But the thing about gas is that it responds very quickly. So it responds more quickly than coal-fired power stations. It responds more quickly even than um, nuclear. So I definitely see that. In, a, in a, uh, a future, we still need gas to stabilize that grid whilst the technology and the learnings and the development on renewable energy increases. So decarbonization in the, um, the LNG value chain. So to every step of the LNG value chain now, we have a focus on decarbonization. So in what we call the upstream side is where the gas comes up from the reservoir. Um, there's a focus on carbon capture um, and storage for the natural CO2, which comes from the reservoir. There is also um, uh, a lot of um, effort looking at technology to capture um, uh, carbon and emissions from um, gas turbine um, exhausts and new projects and also existing projects um, look, are looking at those um, opportunities continuously. So new projects will have, have them inbuilt and existing projects are always looking at whether they can retrofit this sort of technology. On the liquefaction side, which requires a lot of um, energy, so about 7% of um, the feed gas is required to power an LNG plant. It's a, it's a pretty um, energy hungry um, process to liquefy, but um, there's um, a, a lot of um, interest in um, using um, solar power to uh, drive the um, the turbines. In fact, for uh, Curtis Island LNG, um, which we are looking at, um, we are we are currently considering electrifying the um, the turbine drivers. So this will allow us in future to use renewably produced um, electricity to not burn the gas to um, to to for liquid for liquefaction and also to reduce in general the the carbon across the um, the production chain. On the shipping side, LNG driven um, uh, carriers have been around for a long time, but there's a lot of technology looking at um, dual fuel engines, which also reduce the, um, the NOx emissions. So NOx as another um, uh, LNG, sorry, as another um, greenhouse um, gas. On the regasification side, there are some terminals which use solar and there's also, um, uh, starting to look at um, using the waste cold from regasification to um, to generate other other sources of um, energy such as hydrogen. Now, uh, waste the waste cold from um, uh, LNG terminals has for a long time been put to very good use. So I do recall visiting some of our um, LNG buyers in Japan who very proudly served me sushi, which had been frozen in one of their terminals. So for a long time, it's been there's been a, um, a a use in that area. And on the consumption side, so on the consumption in terms of the, the moral imperative and also the commercial, we're now looking at LNG cargoes, which um, are being sold as carbon neutral. So they're sold as carbon neutral because the buyer and the seller in conjunction have been offsetting the carbon, um, uh, the carbon generated in that production with um, a nature-based solutions, uh, renewable energy certificates. So there's, a, there's quite a strong consortium now, um, particularly um, within Asia, of um, bringing buyers and sellers together to promote and improve the processes and making sure that um, offsetting carbon emissions in um, LNG is, um, is justifiable and uh, is the word I'm looking for. Um, uh, it is accepted by um, by the world. 
Okay, so I think this is this is my last slide. Um, and again, it's on the, the world's ambition to net zero. And I really want to leave you just with two messages. So the first one is that by 2050, the energy mix of the world is going to be very, very different from today. I expect by then that fossil fuels will probably make up only 5%, maybe 10% of the mix. The rest will be renewables. It'll be renewables, it'll be hydrogen, it'll be biogas. It probably will have some nuclear in it, um, but uh, it's, going to be, it's going to be quite a different view. And energy companies such as Shell, we recognize that and we are going to be part of that transition. So the second message is that discussion on transition. In 20, over the next 20 to 30 years, LNG and gas does have a strong place in the transition. It's got a strong place because at the moment, uh, we are still using a lot of coal-fired um, uh, power, which, let me repeat it again, um, LNG produces 45 to 55% less emissions than coal-fired power. In China, um, at the moment, they're building about the average of one new coal-fired power plant a day, sorry, a week. The rest of the world together is building about half a coal-fired power plant a week. So the world's energy hunger is still there. Just imagine if we switched that coal to gas, how the reductions in emissions would, would look. So until we have that time where the renewables mix, the, the technology, the proving, the, the, the firming of the energy system reaches that 90 plus percent, 95 percent renewable, I think we actually have a really strong opportunity right now to reduce global greenhouse gas emissions by switching from coal to LNG, by switching from the diesel, the heavy fuel oils, those liquid solid fuels to LNG. So that's, that would be the end of me, Michael. Good. I hope that, um, I hope that I've shared something with you guys, which is a value and um, you've learned something. Thank you, Carolyn. And we've got plenty of questions and quite pertinent to some of your later slides. But before we go to those online, once again, questions from the room. Yes, sir. So, thank you, David Dawson from Carisbrook Consulting. Just a, a question that you may uh, or may not be able to, to give us some um, insight into. Um, in Western Australia, we have, um, you know, gas reserves um, main, um, mandated, if you like, by the government. Uh, in relation to the original, when you go back 40 years, the original Dampier to Bunbury pipeline and and uh, the government taking a role in actually getting gas to market. Um, is there a chance to actually um, reimpose in the Eastern states a gas res reservation policy um, for the export of, L you know, against the export of LNG? And to what extent do you think that uh, it will actually solve the problems that we're currently experiencing in relation to lack of fuel and high cost? All right, so a, a, a complex question. I think I probably can't answer it all. I can maybe give some insight into what's happened in the last um, few weeks with um, uh, the headlines of, you know, like gas prices, crazy, um, the perception that um, gas companies are, um, you know, making a lot of money out of the, the situation. So the reality is, is that I think, unfortunately, across state borders and within state, um, within the states, the, the network of um, supply is, is not very well interconnected. So I can speak for, for Shell QGC only on this, but we actually were limited by um, in delivering um, gas into the rest of the grid because our connections to the, to the, the system were, were at max capacity. We actually had to, to do some deals with um, uh, other companies on getting access through their uh, particular entry points. Um, on the LNG side, we've actually, uh, of all the, the LNG um, uh, providers on um, Curtis Island, we actually, uh, we're, in, we're in a shutdown of one train, but on our other train, we actually reduced it quite significantly because we, we recognised that we needed to provide as much gas as possible to the domestic system. So I, I guess, um, yes, I grew up in Western Australia, so I'm very familiar with that, that gas supply. Um, Maybe the answer is it's it's not just the supply of gas, it's the network, how to get the energy into the system, 
um, not just the, the the actual molecules, but also the um, the, the electricity um, network as well. So I think we hear a lot of um, our politicians politicians talk about um, you know having to to strengthen and expand tran transmission systems, interconnect power um, stations, and I think that's part of the whole discussion. Is that it's not just something that one or two parts of the um, the, the 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 energy system can can work on it's it's really it has to be holistic across the country thank you that's actually a couple of questions online related to domestic gas reservation a few questions on uh, fugitive emissions um, upstream of of the LNG train and whether you factor that into your um, if you like life cycle analysis of of the emissions intensity, greenhouse emissions intensity of LNG? Yeah, absolutely. Really good question. Um, I'm glad it was asked because I was looking at this yesterday. So indeed, methane um, has a much more significant um, impact as a, as a, a greenhouse um, gas compared to, to CO2. So in the past, there has been a lot of um, a discussion from uh, other proponents about um, how much methane is being leaked and how that impacts actually the um, uh, climate change. So Shell has a ambition of um, ensuring that our fugitive emissions remain below 0.2% per, per unit of, um, uh, of energy produced um, by 2025. So as a look, as an LNG operator, I will tell you that my 100% focus is on chasing those uh, fugitive emissions. Um, because when they get out and you have an ignition source, then you have a big problem. So the, the discipline in operating an LNG plant, um, a, a gas plant, has always been around to ensure those fugitive emissions are absolutely um, kept under control um, because it's a, it's, you know, it results in, in fire explosion catastrophe. So fugitive emissions um, in terms of uh, operational um, discipline are extremely high on the, um, uh, high on the agenda. In the upstream side, there's been a lot of work done um, by QGC in reducing venting, in reducing um, the amount of um, uh, CO2 and methane that goes out through the, the TEG system. So there has absolutely been that focus. Um, last year, I believe it was last year, we also um, participated in a trial where um, by a satellite, um, we actually uh, were able to see how much um, fugitive emissions were coming from from the LNG plant in particular, because it's a particular location and easy to see, um, our upstream assets are extremely um, uh, geographically dispersed, so 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 not so easy to um, to to get to get all over. But the outcome of that was actually we were pleasantly surprised that there's a lot less fugitive emissions, particularly from our flare system, than we thought were going to be there. So really, really good question indeed. Um, fugitive emissions is is high on the agenda for many reasons. Yes, and there's a few questions related to that, and it's something that um, a lot of um, our colleagues here at the university are very interested in, some of whom are doing research on it. And of course, whether it's a, a molecule of methane coming out of a gas gathering plant or an LNG train, mm -hmm. it has the same atmospheric impact of a molecule of methane coming from, a, from an open cut coal mine, for mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it's a very rich investigation working out where those fugitive emissions come from. Mm. Um, I saw a paper recently that was looking at some of these big methane leaks coming from sources in places that are quite hard to regulate, for example. So yeah. it's it's a big it's a big um, challenge and uh, but one that's not not easily solved. And I think mm. um, so. Uh, and related questions around around net zero and the role of LNG in net zero. If you want to talk a bit more about that, actually, I've got the IEA stuff. I'm across on that as well. But you're you're the you're the guest of honour. Um, okay, so I guess um, for me in the last few years, I've 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 had quite a um, an awakening around this topic. So in terms of renewables, um, net zero transition, I think the natural response of a lot of people when we say, oh, you know, coal is bad, gas is bad, is, well, oh my God, you know, I've been working in this for, for 20 years. It's not, it's not bad, you know. It does provide um, energy to the rest of the world. And we're not saying that um, coal and um, LNG in particular is going to be a, a baseload fuel for the, the next 40 or 50 years, we absolutely accept that it is going to be um, reduced. But I think 
it's a very emotive discussion. It's very black and white. And um, I used to be a bit black and white on it as well, but I've I've now come to very much the the grey. So I speak a lot about coal and how and and L, and how LNG has got you know say fifty percent less emissions. That's not to say that we should shut down every coal plant because we're actually you know we are we're so fortunate, right? So we have the luxury and the privilege of being in an energy system which is reliable and secure. We have a um, a lifestyle and privilege that um, su surpasses many many people in the world, most people in the world actually. Um, and that has come from these energy sources. So who are we to say that other people in other countries who have not um, come to the same level and enjoy the same things we we do, who are we to say to them, no, you you know, like coal is really terrible. You can't you can't um, um, use it. I think really the recognition that fossil fuels um, have been the the base load for us, but are now tapering off is important. And I think also it's important to recognise that uh, a change from natural gas, a change from coal to natural gas now actually does make an immediate um, difference. So yes, in by 2050, we're going to be 95% renewables, but are we going to continue the, like, are we going to have a step change? Are we just going to keep enjoying, um, you know, the, the lovely heating in this room, which I quite like? Um uh, until that point where suddenly it's like, right, you know, no more. We need to then go 100% to renewables. But that that's not a, a, a reliable or, a, a, you know, a sensible kind of um, uh, view of it. Actually, as our, um, as our CEO had said, um, there's no use in trying to dismantle the, dismantle the current energy system that we're living under until we've built the next one. So we are trying to build the next one. Um, and I think a lot of people out there would like us to, to, to dismantle the current one. But um, as we've experienced um, recently with, yeah, with the, the floods and the rains and the, um, the lack of sun, then that comes with its own problem. So it's a, it's a transition. It's absolutely a transition. And I, I see like IEA did a report Bloomberg, others do reports on what the net zero world is going to look like. We're doing one ourselves at the moment. We're going to publish uh, in August. Um, and uh, you get very different answers of what that net zero world looks like. So the IEA has got a couple of scenarios, some of which has very considerable fossil fuel use still by mid-century and then very large amounts of carbon capture and storage through to others which have much, much less like Bloomberg and so on. So when I look at that, I, I just see it as a, as a very, very wickedly complicated and uncertain problem and we could all be wrong on what we end up doing by 2050. Mm -hmm. um, um, I, I gave a talk, uh, I was in Japan last week, so you talked about some of the big customers for Australian LNG. I was in Japan last week, I gave a talk at the Tokyo Institute of Technology about decarbonisation and options. And I thought, oh, well, I'll do a little comparison because we did a nice little study here. My student, Yuman's in the room. I saw him before. There he is. Hello, Yuman. He did a lovely paper. It appeared earlier this year about how decarbonising the Victorian system, not just electricity, but coal, uh, transport and natural gas. And I said, well, how big is Japan compared to Victoria? Victoria is about 270,000 square kilometres and Japan's about 300 and something thousand. So about 30% bigger. Mm -hmm. We have 6.6 .6 million Victorians. They have 126 million Japanese. Um, and if you just built a fully renewable energy system to supply transport industry and electricity in Victoria, you need about two and a half to three Melbournes, to, which is 10,000 square kilometers. One, one Melbourne is 10,000 square kilometers, about four, four or 5% of the state. So if you've got, what's that, um, uh, uh, 20 times the number of Japanese in an area that's 30% bigger, mm. How do, you, how do you supply it? And unsurprisingly, the Japanese import more than 90% of their energy mm -hmm. as, as a result of that basic thing. Mm -hmm. So it's a wickedly hard problem. Um, South Korea is in a similar situation, yeah. and then you've got billions of people elsewhere. So um, I, it would seem to me, and this is my last question to you, apologies for that mini speech, um, if we are going to go to net zero and you've got LNG, I could imagine in 1980 people saying, you can't cool this stuff down to minus 160. That's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. 
now people talk about cooling down hydrogen to yeah. minus 250 mm -hmm. yeah. and you know how to make cryogenic liquids at industrial scale mm. how hard do you reckon it would be to establish over the next 30 years a, a, a new cryogenic market or an ammonia market or something else that would mm. ultimately displace coal and natural gas by mid-century well i mean so again, again, this is just um, my view. Um, I have looked a little bit at hydrogen. I'm not an expert, so don't please don't ask me any questions on the process of um, creating hydrogen. Um, but your yeah, hydrogen has always struck me as just a much more difficult and a much more dangerous um, uh, product to make. So from from the operations perspective, as a, as a gas plant operator, your the the thing that you fear most is the escape of molecules because when you have molecules. When you have oxygen, you have an ignition source, then you have fire and explosion. So the hydrogen molecule, of course, is much, much smaller. Um, indeed, you're, you're, as you said, minus 260, um, minus 262 degrees or something. So just a few degrees off absolute zero. The, the materials and the technology and the discipline needed to um, produce and liquefy um, hydrogen is, again, a step up from, from where we are now. I think absolutely we will get there, um, but it's like it's like any industry in the infancy. We we will have to learn, um, and we'll have to learn very quickly. And we we probably don't really want to rush things too much. Um, the out the I spoke about the 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 worst um, incident in um, LNG history in Cleveland, where 140 people were killed um, purely from the operations perspective. Yeah. Hydrocarbon is absolutely that carbon, sorry, hydrogen is absolutely that carbon um, free fuel of the future. Um, I've probably got another maybe 20 years of my career to um, to see out. So I do expect to be at some stage part of the design or the operation or standing in a hydrogen plant. Um, so it's honestly, it's, it's, it's scary, but it's also it's also the answer to the to the climate change problem that we have. Well, that's. I think I'm on. Is that right? Um, I think that's going to, where we're going to end it because we're almost ten past four and we're ten minutes over. But um, got another twenty minutes of networking outside for those here in person. Um, please thank Carolyn. That was great, Carolyn. Thank you very much for coming up and visiting. Thank you, everyone.